peace of the Lord be with you. It's Monday of last week. I'm walking to chapel. I'm walking slowly. I'm sad. I'm just sad. The news from last night exploded into our community like a grenade of grief. And I'm still living into the shock. With Haiti in the background, our fingers feel like they're on the pulse of a world throbbing in grief. In such a short time, everything feels so different. And as I walk, I'm thinking of our friends, David and Emma. Thinking of David, a unique and special man. He had that rare constellation of gifts and constitution of character to bring different people and divergent groups together. I remember him as someone who built bridges and showed us how to walk across them. David had a heart as large and as spacious as the continent he called home. He possessed a controlled aggression and a fierce and deep faith. And it was that faith that propelled him to take to the clouds where he dreamed of being a missionary pilot for his people in Africa. He studied as one who didn't just want to know more, but to be more. And he wanted us, Hope College, to be more, to know David, was to love him. And I'm thinking of Emma, our beloved Emma, who was everything you would want your daughter to be. She was color in a world of gray. She had the energy and size of a hummingbird. She was five foot nothing and 500 feet of gospel passion. It's as if her passion had a knowing participation in the ultimate source of all life. She was beautiful inside and out. Emma had an overwhelming sense of empathy for people and for animals. And she saw every day as an opportunity filled to love and serve others. She ached for justice, to be in a world, to be in a world that loved as Jesus loved. She didn't think about living life. She went out and lived it. Emma was that rare soul that when she would walk into a dark forest, the forest, the fireflies would light up with, res- with recognition and excitement. And their death has cut deep as it has wide in our little community of hope. David and Emma were jewels whose lives illuminated for us light from true light. And this week, our campus has felt just a little bit more dim. And as I think about them, I am sad because I miss them. Words get caught in my throat. And as I walk to chapel on Monday, the questions begin to swirl in my mind. There are the emotional questions. Where do we go with this? What can we say? What do we do? How can this happen? It isn't fair. No, it isn't. Then there are the questions of how David and Emma's family are doing. How are their friends doing? How are are they feeling? There's the questions of what happened. The questions that come with the nature of the accident itself. More questions than answers. And we have to live with the uncertainty of not having all the answers. And as I walk, I'm thinking to myself, pastorally, there's the question of how to speak and encourage others how to speak without trying to solve it or button it up and to move on. This is not something we simply move on from. There is always a temptation to want to give platitudes and quick answers to try to make sense of this loss. People with good intentions can often say hurtful things. Don't cry. Don't be sad. They're in a better place, as if the grief and the tears are somehow misplaced. But they're not. It's a week where we cry. It's a week where we hold each other. It's a week where we remember who we are and whose we are. 
And underneath these questions, the emotional questions, the pastoral questions, the logistical questions, underneath these are all the ones that are below the surface, deep in the stomach. These are the old questions that have no easy answers, the questions we whisper to ourselves under our breath. These are the questions of the soul to God. The question of divine goodness and providence in the face of evil and tragedy. We ask, God, where, where were you? Why didn't you stop it? Save them. God, how can you be good? How can we sing of God's hesed, of God's everlasting faithfulness with confidence again? Is this part of some divine plan? And if this is, doesn't that make you culpable? And if you are culpable, then are you really God? Are you really good? These are questions that bleed from the sharp edge of Providence's knife. Where do we go with these questions? What confidence or assurance do we have in the Christian faith in the face of such a loss? What resources can still the soul when all the world seems to be throbbing in grief? These are the questions I'm feeling as I walk to chapel on Monday, and as I've walked to the chapel every day since. As I walk through the pine grove, I picked my eyes up off my shoelaces and I looked up, and then I see it. I see it high and I see it lifted up. I see the steeple of Western Seminary spiraling toward the heavens, and atop it, I see it set against a dark sky, giving it the appearance of suspension over the campus. The cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. I see it as if for the first time. I see in that moment the cross of Christ as a protest against all the death, all the destruction, and all the tears of this world. And as I look at that cross, I can't help but think of the words of P.T. Forsyth, who says, the cross of Christ, with its judgment grace, its tragic love, its grievous glory, its severe salvation, and its finished work is God's only self-justification in such a world. On the cross, Christ not only shares the darkness, he uses the cross to transform the darkness into light. Exalted as a beacon of victory, the cross illuminates the darkness like an eternal flame that burns and is never consumed. I know of no answer to the problem of evil, none that satisfies any way. None that explains away the grief, makes sense of the pain, replaces or recalibrates the loss. Theology, theodicy, the problem of evil in the face of a good God is a puzzle, but the answers cannot quell the tears of a mother who has received a phone call that her son, that her daughter, is lost. There's no answer I know to the problem of evil, but there is a victory. There is a victory over death, death. And that, my friends, is our hope that we look to. And this week, when I have felt the darkness closing in deep in the resources of my soul, I have been looking up to see that cross and to hear, as if for the first time, its gospel message, to hear the greatest sermon Jesus ever preached. It is the sermon I have needed to hear this week. And maybe you have too. To hear this sermon, Turn with me to the John's Gospel, chapter 20, and listen. Listen for the Gospel message. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. She ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out, 
and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. When he reached the tomb, he bent over and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head lying, not with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went into the tomb, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their home. But Mary, Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she bent down to look in and saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. The angels said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, Mary said, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And when He had said this. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them. Tell them that I am ascending to my Father and their Father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And when it was evening on that day, The first day of the week and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and he said, and he said, peace be with you. And then he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I send you. And after this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas, Thomas said to them, unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, The disciples again were in the house, and Thomas was with them. And although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, and he said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, do you believe because you have seen me? Blessed are you who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. We find the disciples huddled together And I imagine like us this week with questions whispering under their breath. They're gathered with the door locked, trembling with doubt, suspicions of conspiracy theory and fear. Jesus is dead. He's been murdered. The body is missing. Mary has come back talking hysterics, talking crazy. She says that she has seen the Lord. They are shocked and paralyzed in fear and grief, and they don't know what to say. The words choke in their throats. Again, they are bleeding from the sharp edge of Providence's blade. The cross reminds us, doesn't it, that to follow Jesus is no insurance policy from the harshest realities of life. 
Jesus never promised any disciple an easy path, nor that life would be fair. In fact, he promised that if you follow him, it probably won't. That if we follow him, we'll have to take up a cross too. That we'll have to endure our suffering. That we will have to walk in and feel the great tribulations of our time. Things won't always work out the way we want them to. The cross is a guarantee that we are not called out of suffering, but a life that participates into suffering more fully. Which is maybe why Jesus said earlier in his ministry, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. The disciples are gathered together in fear and in grief. And what a pendulum swing from the week before. Just seven days ago, the disciples had the hopes of being first in line for Jesus inaugurating a new kingdom in Israel. And now, and now they are huddled in fear, wondering who's next. And in that climate of grief and of fear and uncertainty, as they whispered the questions underneath their breath, out of nowhere, even though the doors were shut, like so many of our hearts, Jesus shows up and proclaims the sermon all creation has been groaning and labor pains to hear. On the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Jesus wakes up, untethers himself from the linen cloth of death, and wipes the cobwebs from his eyes, and steps out of the tomb and into the bright light of a fresh new dawn, and announces to all who has an ear to hear, all who are in mourning, all who are crying, peace be with you. This is the sermon that gives the resurrection its meaning. For peace be with you is the revelation of the resurrection. It is the revelation that is reasonable to believe even as it is beyond all reason. Jesus' sermon does not declare a wish. Peace be with you is the declaration of an accomplished fact, an accomplished act by God on our behalf. In the act of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross, the power of sin is crucified to death in Jesus. And with the power of the resurrection, death itself is now crucified in the new life of Christ. It is a fact that in and through Jesus, the long-standing enmity between God and humanity, that darkness that followed humanity out of the garden, that has haunted every person, every generation, every culture, every government, every civilization is put to rights. Peace be with you is Jesus' declaration of victory after a long, cold war. And the cross is the symbol of God's defiance of life over death. And we know, of course, that peace in the biblical sense is more than a ceasefire between enemies. It is more than a description of nonviolence. Peace is what we were created for. Peace is the word in Hebrew, of course, we know as shalom. And shalom is the webbing together of all things, of all things in justice and fulfillment and delight. To be given shalom is to be given reconciliation with God and with ourselves, with each other, and with all creation. In other words, when Jesus says, shalom, peace be with you, he is announcing the accomplishment of salvation. And that is why when we come in here and out of here and say to one another in a week like this, peace be with you. And also with you, when we say this, these are not just mere words. When we say this, this is shorthand for the world's only hope, our reconciliation and atonement with God in and through Jesus Christ on the cross. When we say it to each other, we are echoing Jesus' first sermon after the resurrection. And when we say it, we are announcing light into the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it. When Jesus preaches, peace be with you, he is announcing to his disciples and to me and you that by his resurrection, God has inaugurated an alternative reality that we have no choice but to alter ourselves to its demands and conditions. 
And one of those demands and one of those conditions is that even in the darkest hour, we remain firmly a people of hope. It is a reality that declares as a fact that you are forgiven. A reality that says you are saved. A reality that says you are loved. It is a reality that says you belong to your only Savior in life and in death, to Jesus Christ. It is a reality that saves us by a decisive and moral act of God in the world. It is the reality of hope whispering to us that you don't have to be afraid of the dark anymore. This is what the cross is whispering to us every time we look upon it. And when I look upon it, I remember what we believe, that Jesus is still showing up, that Jesus is is still walking through walls where people are gathered in grief too deep for words and proclaiming to all who have an ear to hear, peace be with you. And I believe Jesus will do anything to proclaim it. I believe that he'll go to hell and back to say it to us. If he's dead, he'll come back to life. If there's a stone in his way, he'll roll it aside. If we don't recognize him, he'll speak our name. If the door is closed, He'll walk through the walls, and if our hearts are locked, he'll pick it, simply to say to us, the good news, a declaration of fact, peace be with you. This peace reminds us that our Redeemer lives. It reminds us that there is a balm in Gilead. It reminds us that there is a comforter. It reminds us there is a healer that there is light in the darkness. This peace given to us reveals where we go with our questions. And we don't go to a place. We don't go to a class. We don't go to a theological system. We don't go to ideas. We go to the living, resurrected Jesus Christ, who is our peace. Jesus, who is dead, yes, and who is alive and is right now at the right hand of God, our Father, interceding for you, calling you, healing you, redeeming you, whispering to all who have an ear to hear, peace be with you. This is the evangelical gospel that Jesus breathes into the lungs of true faith, And it continues to be the message he sends us, his disciples, out into the world to share. As the Father sent me, says Jesus, so I send you. And he breathes on them the Holy Spirit. He's breathing on us the Holy Spirit to share in the comfort and the good news of this salvation. This gospel is what set David to fly. This victory over the darkness is what inspired Emma to pursue a life of love and of justice in Jesus' name. Peace be with you is the church's shorthand for God's salvation and redemption of the world. It is code for the eternal hope of everlasting life with God. And it is this gospel, the good news of the resurrection, is what allows the saints to rise to their feet and proclaim with confidence, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. This is the hope that allows us to believe with confidence that we will one day see and be with David and Emma again on a glory of a day yet to be revealed, a day that has been inaugurated on the cross even though it has not been fully consummated, a day yet to be revealed when God will wipe away every tear from our eyes and death will be no more. And mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. And until that day, we wait in patience, in long suffering, with the deep aches of our soul. Until then, we keep gathering together. We keep worshiping in hope. Until then, We keep going to the only place we can with the questions that we whisper under our breath, the questions that have no easy answers. We go to the cross, which is to say we go to Jesus. That Jesus is the only answer God has that makes any sense in such a world as this. My friends, you can look to the cross 
which is to say, you can look to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Take your questions there. The only answer to the questions that we have is a gospel one, an evangelical one. For the resurrected Jesus is the only answer that makes sense of the deepest aches and questions of the soul. For he is the light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never, ever overcome him. Let's pray. Lord, when we do not know how to pray, you are praying for us. When our questions are left unanswered, Lord, we take them to you and we ask that you would be to us the measure we need. Jesus Christ, remind us again of the power, the shock, and the awe of your resurrection. And may your resurrection be to us not just a theological idea, but the assurance and hope of our soul. Jesus, walk among us by sending upon us your Holy Spirit, and in your spirit, bind us together as a people of hope, waiting with anticipation to see David and Emma on that glorious day yet to be revealed. We pray this in your name, Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, and all people said, amen.